Hey everyone, this is Neil from Edureka and welcome to today's session on Java Tutorial. Now, we've all heard of Java either from our friends or from the internet and Java is something that you would quite often hear across from different sources as well. So you may all be wondering what Java is and what does it exactly do and we're going to understand what Java is, how it functions as well as I'm going to help you build a good fundamental knowledge in Java as part of today's session. Now keeping that in mind, let's move forward and look at today's agenda. Now we'll start off with an introduction to Java. Then I'll help you understand why you need to learn Java and then we'll be discussing the various features of Java. After that we'll be looking at the Java development kit and then following that we'll understand how does Java work. Once you're clear on these concepts we will move into the core Java and we'll understand the various data types in Java, the various operators that you can use in Java. I'll also help you understand the control statements in Java and we'll be discussing about arrays in Java. Finally, to give you a good fundamental knowledge, we'll also be discussing about the object-oriented concepts in Java. Now, let's move forward and have an introduction to Java. So, Java was created by James Goslin in 1995 for Sun Microsystems. So, Java was originally planned to be named as Oak, but that name was taken. So, they went after and named it after their favorite coffee, which was Java. Now, Java is a platform independent programming language. Now, when I say platform independent programming language, what they basically mean is that once you've written your code, you can run it anywhere as such. So there's not going to be any specific dependencies or any changes that you need to perform on that code once you've brought it to a different system as such. Now, there are mainly three key features of Java. So Java follows a concurrent approach. Now, when I talk about concurrency, it basically means that when you have a lot of statements that need to be executed, Rather than executing them one after the other, you can concurrently execute them and thereby increase the overall efficiency as well. So this saves you a lot of time as such and this can be achieved using Java. After that, Java follows a class-based approach. Now here when I say class-based approach, it basically means that everything that you're going to be writing as part of your Java code, it is going to be present inside a class. Now, don't worry too much about what a class is or how it is going to help us. We'll be talking that towards the later half of the session. But just understand that every code that you're going to be writing is going to be written inside a class as such. After that, Java follows an object-oriented style. So, to those of you who are not familiar with the different styles of programming, there are mainly two styles that programming languages follow. One is the procedural style and the second is an object-oriented style. So Java actually follows an object oriented style where everything is considered to be an object. So the variables that you're going to be using, the functions that you're going to be using, the operations that you're going to be performing, everything is going to be done using objects as such. So are we clear with respect to the first slide? Okay, so I have my first question here from Prashant. Prashant is asking me why is object oriented style so important? Now Prashant to help you understand this, I'll just give you a comparison of object oriented style to the procedural style that I had just talked about. Now basically in procedural style, what you do is that you follow a top down approach. That is all the statements that you wish to execute are written in a sequential order one after the other and then you go on executing one by one. So here when you look at object oriented style, firstly it follows a bottom up approach and I had already mentioned you everything here is considered to be an object. So when object basically means that everything can be related into the real world instance. So when we talk about an object, definitely it can be related to a real world instance. Let's say you have an animal. So you would be having an object for animal present in your programming language. Or let's say you're going to be writing something that is going to deal with your employee database. Then here every employee would be considered to be an object as such. So apart from that Java also makes sure that through object oriented programming style your code and your data is highly secure as well. So the feature of security is highly improvised in object oriented programming style. So I hope with that you're clear with respect to why object oriented programming style is important. Okay, so Prashant wants to know some other programming languages that follow object oriented approach. So Prashant, uh, the other programming languages that follow object oriented approach is uh, C++, then you have Visual Basic .NET, then you have Chash.NET. Now Chash is a good competitor for Java. So these are other programming languages that make use of object oriented style. Are you clear Prashant? So now that we've got an introduction to Java, let's go and answer the elephant in the room why we need to learn Java. Now this is something every one of you would be wondering and let me help you understand that with the upcoming slides. 
So TIEOP is a company that mainly deals with the codes written by a lot of organization. What they do is they cleanse and they improve the efficiency of code. So even if I have to give you a number, they deal with about 500 billion lines of code every day. So what they have done is that they had conducted a survey based on the usage of different programming languages in the industry as well as they had also considered the searches for these codes across multiple domains as such. So the keyword search for these programs were taken from Google, they were taken from Yahoo, YouTube and then this index was generated. So this index is something that is released every year and you can see here the popularity of each of the programming languages. So here you can see how Java has dominated this field from early 2000s till the present 2017 as such. You can see there is no close competitor to Java as well. This in itself should give you an idea of how popular Java is and how widely it is being used in the industry. Now apart from this, let me give you a better understanding of how Java is used in different industries. So here I have just picked eight of the popular domains as such. Now in eight of these domains, let me give you an understanding of how Java is being used in them. So when we talk about the financial service, here your server side applications will be written in Java. Now Java is a highly preferred language to write server side applications and financial service domain is something that mainly uses the server side applications. Apart from that when you say even the retail domain. Now the billing applications that you see when you go to a store. This could be a normal store, it could be a supermarket, it could even be a popular outlet as well. So their retail applications billing system is completely written in Java. Apart from that in your banking domain, your transaction management as well as your transactional programs are written in Java. When you look at the IT industry definitely you can understand Java is a programming language. So you have a lot of applications that are developed using Java and Java is again one of the most preferred as well as the most used programming language in the industry today. So a lot of applications either are written in Java or make use of some features present in Java using the Java APIs. Then when you look at the scientific and research community, there your calculative as well as your operational programs are written in Java. So using Java they are able to process as well as manage huge amount of data. Now again when we say huge amount of data, we are all familiar with how scientific community deals. So they would be using numbers that are way too big for normal applications to handle itself. So all those numbers, all those data is going to be handled by Java quite easily. When we look at the stock market, now this is something that is quite useful. So in the stock market there are a lot of algorithms that are written in Java which help organizations to understand better as to which company they need to make their investments as well. And when you look at the most popular domains today, it is the big data as well as the Android domain. So here your Android programs make use of Java and your Android operating system itself highly makes use of Java and various Java APIs as such. When we look at the big data domain, your Hadoop mainly uses Java and you even have a concept of MapReduce which involves Java as such. So I hope with this you've got an idea of the various domains where Java is being used. And these are not the only domains where Java is being used. I've just selected some of the few domains. But you need to understand that Java is a very big ocean. So it's not something that is just restricted to certain domains. Java is being used across different platforms in different domains. Everywhere you see you can find some amount of Java present there. But when you look at it in a positive way, Java is also an ocean of opportunity. When it's being used across so many domains, it's being when you're generating multiple applications daily on Java, then it also brings in a good amount of job opportunities for you as well. And this is something that you all need to concentrate on. Here are some of the technologies that make use of Java extensively. So let's start off with the continuous testing field. So when we talk about the continuous testing field, this basically means your automation testing. Now you, this is something that you would have heard quite often and in the automation testing field, Selenium is presently one of the most widely used to. So Selenium extensively makes use of Java as part of their core programs. So you're going to be writing a lot of codes in Java as part of your Selenium. Then again we've discussed about Android, here your Android applications that you find in your Google Play Store as well as your Android operating system makes use of Java and various Java APIs as such. We've also discussed about how Big Data and the Hadoop field makes use of Java as part of their core features. Then when we look at different frameworks, now you have Spring, Hibernate, Time Leaves, these are some of the popular frameworks and they also extensively use Java as part of their course. 
Now, spring and hibernate is something that we'll be discussing more in our upcoming sessions where we'll be extensively deep diving into these two frameworks. Now, again, when we look at web development field here, when you talk about these two Angular as well as Node.js. So these are basically scripting languages here. You, what you're going to be doing is that you're going to be using JavaScript extensively as part of their core as such. Okay. So any questions still here? So I have a question here from Bharat. Bharat is asking me what is a framework. So Bharat, a framework basically is a structure that you'll be following for developing your applications. So once you have a structure, you get an idea of how the application should be developed. And again, Spring, Hibernate are some of the most popular used application frameworks across the industry. So when you have to develop an application, you will be following these frameworks to have a standardized structure for your application. So are you clear Bharat? Okay, so Bharat is clear. So any other questions? Okay, so Divya says no, Arun says no, Anna is clear. That's great to see you guys. So again, I'd like to remind you at any point, if you're not clear, if you do have any questions, you can put it across in the chat window so I can help you clarify it then and there itself. So let's move forward and talk about the various features that Java has to offer. Now, when we talk about the features of Java, this basically is also called as the buzzwords of Java. So these are the most essential features which have made Java the most popular programming language of the industry today. So we'll be talking about each of them one by one. Let's move forward and discuss that. So the first feature that you'll be discussing is Java is simple. So when we say Java is simple, it basically means that anyone can learn Java and it is very easy for programmers to use it and make their code highly efficient as compared to other programming languages. Now after that we have the portability. So I've already discussed the same with you in the start. Your Java application once it is written can be executed anywhere. It can be across multiple platforms. It could be across multiple operating systems. They could have separate configurations. But again your Java program would not have any problem in executing across these platforms. After that Java follows an object oriented approach. We've already discussed everything in Java is considered to be an object and every operation that you're going to be performing is through these objects itself. Now when we talk about the security feature of Java, Java does not use the concept of pointers as well. So if some of you are familiar with C++, there's this concept of pointers, which basically means you're pointing to a specific memory location. So this is something a lot of programmers face hassle in. So that concept is completely removed from Java as well. Now, apart from that, your Java virtual machine, that is the environment in which you'll be running your Java programs also checks the code, whether there's any threat present or if there's any error present in it before it goes on to execute your code. Again, when you look at the web development side of Java as well, you have this concept of applet, which ensures that the security of the code is met as such. So once you've written your code, it cannot be read by any other person. What you'll be doing is you'll be giving them an intermediate file that is known as byte code. So this byte code is not a directly readable file. So with that, your code is also completely secure. So no one can actually directly read your source code. Okay, so when we talk about the distributed feature of Java, this basically refers to the remote method invocation. Now you don't have to worry too much about this. We'll be talking about this in our upcoming sessions, but I'll just give you an overview here. So you're going to be writing a lot of programs, but they're going to be linked to each other and not everything may be present on the same system that you're executing your program. So through the remote method invocation, what you can do is if their dependencies are directly accessible over a network, your Java program will be able to access this, take all the necessary information that it wants, and then it will be able to execute it. And this will seem like an easy process. Java will make it look like all the programs and dependencies are present in your same system but it's a quite complex operation. But through Java's distributed feature, it becomes quite easy for you to achieve this. After that, you have the dynamics feature of Java. So when we say dynamic, it basically refers to the information gathering as well as the dependency association at runtime. So a lot of information that your program requires, a lot of dependencies, or classes or packages that your program requires is only associated to your code just before it's going to be executed as such. So it, there's a lot of runtime features that comes into picture when you're going to be executing a Java program. After that, you have the robust feature. So this basically refers to how your Java program can be suitable across multiple environments as such. So your Java code is basically 
check both at compile time as well as run time. After that, your Java memory allocation. So this is something that is quite important. Memory allocation and memory releasing is done by Java in turn itself. So you don't have to worry about the hassle for allocating memory for your variable. Then once you've done with the variable, you need to release that memory. Here Java does everything for you. So that completely relieves your burden of memory management. Then you have the high performance feature. Now Java achieves its high performance feature through the creation of bytecode. Now the bytecode basically is an intermediate language that is present between your high level language that is your English and your assembly language which is your machine language that will be consisting of ones and zeros. So once you've actually converted your high level language to bytecode it becomes very easy to translate it to machine level language. So once you have the bytecode it will be very easy for you to run it across multiple environments and it will be very easy for you to achieve high performance as well. So any questions with respect to the features of Java? Is there any feature that you're not clear with that you want me to re-explain? Okay, Prashant says clear, Anna is clear, Bharat, Divya, everyone's clear. That's great to see guys. So moving forward, let's talk about the Java development kit. So here there are mainly three components that you need to understand with respect to the Java environment as a programmer. You have your Java development kit, you have your Java runtime environment and you have your Java virtual machine. So these are three essential components. I'll just show you how these are related to each other and give you a good understanding with respect to them as well. So here are the three components that I had just mentioned. You have your Java virtual machine, your Java runtime environment and your Java development kit. So your Java virtual machine. So basically this is one of the components of Java in which you're going to be executing your bytecode. So whichever machine has your Java virtual machine, then that machine can directly execute your Java code. All you need to do for executing a Java code is that you need to have your Java virtual machine present there. So let's say you want to give a program which you have developed in Java, then all they need to do is that they need to have their Java virtual machine present in the system and then they can directly go ahead and execute that program. But then you have your Java runtime environment. That is the environment in which you're going to be running your Java programs. So there you're going to be having your Java class files as well as your other files as such. Now to give you a better understanding of the other files, you can look at the image here. So basically these are the other files that you're going to be having as part of your Java runtime environment. Which are of these files are required, the JRE will directly link it to the JVM as required. So all these will be present in your JRE and after that you have your JDK. JDK basically refers to your Java development environment. So this is something all developers require to have. So in case if you want to write your program as such or you want to create various programs, then you need to have your Java development kit present on your system. So again, when you talk about your Java development kit, it basically has these following development tools. So as you require, you can use either of these tools as part of your code. So are you clear with respect to the Java virtual machine, the Java runtime environment and Java development kit? Okay, so Divya is asking me, I already have Java installed in my system. Do I need to reinstall it? Now Divya, unless you have specifically downloaded and installed the Java development kit, I believe you'll be having the Java virtual machine installed in your system. So this is basically used to run the Java codes present on different browsers. So I think that is what you're referring to. Yeah, so that is your Java virtual machine that is installed in your system. So what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be downloading the Java development kit and installing it on your system. But before we go ahead and do that, let's try to understand how Java works. Now, let's consider the two main environments. First is the compile time environment. That is the environment where you're going to be developing your Java code. And then you have the runtime environment where you're going to be executing your program as such. So, so we're going to start off with our Java source code that is going to be of a dot Java extension. So every code that you're going to be writing and saving should be saved with an extension dot Java. So this basically helps it understand that this is a Java source code file. So once you've completed your code, then you can go ahead and use the Java compiler to compile your source code. Check if there are any errors present in your code and then create a bytecode. So once you've completed the coding of your application, then you've translated to the bytecode, then what you're going to be doing is that you're going to be moving it either locally or through a network. That is, you're going to be distributing it through the internet. So once that is done, basically whoever has to run it will follow the following process to execute. So what happens is first is that a class loader is called. Your application may use objects from different classes. So their corresponding details are loaded from the Java class library. 
After that, the byte code is verified. So here again, when we say byte code verification, now you're transferring your byte code across a network. So there is a slight chance that your code may get corrupted or some virus or some changes may have happened through that transition. So your Java byte code verifier checks if your code integrity is met and if there are any errors present in that code. So once that is done, basically what happens is that you're going to first send it to the Java interpreter as well as a compiler as such. So this again ensures your code has no errors. It makes it easier for your execution of the code because you're running it through an interpreter if it required or a compiler as well. And then you're going to execute it on your runtime system. So once you've bought it to your runtime system, then it interacts with the operating system, which in turn interacts with your hardware, where your memory allocation, data storage, everything happens as such. So are you clear with respect to how Java works? Okay, so Divya is clear. I've got a confirmation from Anna. Bharat is also understood, Deepthi, Prashant, that's great to see you guys. So enough with the theory part, let's move ahead and install Java Development Kit on your system. Now to download the Java Development Kit, what you need to do is just go to your browser. Here just search for JDK Download. So this will directly lead you to Oracle's page where you can download the Java Development Environment. So here you have your option to download Java Development Kit that is JDK version 8U 1.2.1. So this basically means you're going to be downloading Java 8. Now again to give you an idea in the industry presently most organizations are working on Java Environment 7 but I again recommend that you start off with Java 8 itself because most organizations have already started migrating to Java 8. So all you need to do is click on download here then you need to specify which operating system is your choice before that just accept their license and then you can choose the corresponding operating system. Now the installation of Java is very easy all you need to do is just click next 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 until you're done with it. After that comes an essential process where you need to specify your Java development kits path. So go ahead and install Java on your system and then I'll help you understand how to set the path variable. So now that you have installed the Java JDK on your system, it's time we go ahead and configure the path of Java on your system. Now to do that, all you need to do is go to your my computer. Here just right click and select properties option. So here you'll be getting system properties. Now all you need to do is click on advanced system settings. And here you have the option of environment variables. Just click on that and you will get this option for setting environment variables. Now, if you do not have a path variable already set, just click on new and create a path variable. But if you do have an existing path value, so I already have multiple programming languages set on my system. So their path is already set. But in case if you do not have the path variable, just click on new and create. So then comes the question, what do you need to specify in this path? So here what you need to do is that you need to give the location for your Java bit. That is the JDK bit. So go back to my computers to the location where you have installed Java. Now in case if you have not changed the path, it will be present in C programs, Java. And then here you have two options, Java, J, uh, you have JDK and JRE. So go inside JDK and then inside bin. So take this complete location, copy it, come back to your environment variable and specify it here. So in case there's, there's any other value, just put a colon and then put the new value. But if there's nothing set, you're creating a new variable, then just directly specify this path length. Just click on OK. And then to check out if your Java path has been set, just run your command prompt. That is, here just type Java C. So by this, what you're doing is that you're basically checking your if your Java compiler has been set. Just press on enter. And in case if you get these values as such, then the path has been set correctly. But in case if you are getting Java not found, then let me know. I'll be able to assist you accordingly. Okay, so now that you've all set your path, let me just show you how to run and compile a Java code. So to compile your Java code, first go to the directory where you have specified your Java. Now it's time I'll show you how to run a Java code. So all you need to do is CD, go to the directory where your Java code is present. I'll run the hello world program that I had shown you earlier. So CD Java, it was present inside Java. Now to compile your code, you need to specify Java C followed by the class file in which you have stored your code. So I had stored it inside hello.java 
and once you type this you can see a class file would be created there so I already had it created let me just remove that and show it to you again so let me just remove this and let me just re-execute this command so if you see here a bytecode gets created with the piler command so once you've done that it's time we execute this program so to do that all you need to do is specify Java and then your hello.exe so once you've compiled your code let's execute it so just specify Java and the file name so you can see the code has been executed but this becomes a tedious process when you have huge amount of programs that you want to execute so to overcome this challenge what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be installing an IDE IDE basically refers to an integrated development environment where you can basically compile as well as see your code now the most popular IDE is Eclipse so let's go ahead and download and use Eclipse because this is a standard development tool that you're going to be using as part of your industry now to download Eclipse all you need to do is go back to your browser search for Eclipse download so go to the Eclipse download option and here I'd recommend that you download Eclipse Neon itself now there's a direct option to download the 64-bit for Windows but let's say if you're using a 32-bit you can go to the packages option and here you can choose the corresponding package now there are multiple versions of Eclipse for Java developers so I recommend that you download the Java Eclipse IDE for Java J2E development so this is a complete package and it will be very easy for you to use this as well in our upcoming sessions so specify your system and download it it will directly give you a zip file now inside that zip file once you've extracted it you will directly have your Eclipse which you can launch from there immediately let me show you how the Eclipse looks like so this is your Eclipse IDE so to your left you have all your Java projects then you'll have your code present here and this is your output field so don't worry we'll be using the Eclipse IDE in our next slide so just hold on to that any questions with respect to the installation or any problems that you have faced all right so now that all of you also installed Eclipse in your system it's time we move ahead so we'll be discussing the various data types present in Java so these are some of the primitive data types that are present in Java they can be mainly classified into four different aspects so first you have your integer then you have your float character and boolean now integer basically is used to store a numerical value so this numerical value again when I say cannot have decimal points for decimal points you have float so any numerical value that does not have a decimal point value can be used to store int so again with an integer type itself you have four different types you have byte you have long you have short and you have int so based on the numerical value which you're going to be storing you can use either of these so to give you a better understanding in a byte you can store a number that is between either minus 128 to plus 127 but at the same time when you look at int occupies four bytes so within an integer you can store a numerical value that is between 2100 crores to plus 2100 crores so it's a huge number itself so mostly we stick to integer itself but again based on your need you can even use long as well so if you have a number that is going beyond that as well you can use long so based on your need you can use a corresponding value so here you can see how you initialized int num is equal to 56 so I am creating a numerical value of integer type that is going to store a value 56 now after that you have the float type again float type can be used to store decimal pointed numerical values so in case if you do have any value that is taking decimal point value then you're going to be using a float variable so again based on your need of storing the number you can use float or double and you can see how I've initialized a floating number is equal to 568151.3285 so are you clear with respect to integer and float okay so Divya is asking me what will happen if I store a decimal value inside integer so good question Divya so what happens is that if you initialize a number to be integer and you're going to be storing a decimal value inside that let me tell you this so if let's say int num is equal to this value that is 56851.3285 then the decimal point value will be discarded and only 56851 will be stored inside that number are you clear Divya alright 
Okay, now apart from numerical values, let's say if you wish to store a character, then you have the care type. So you can see how you've used character to store a single character. So any of the alphabetical characters, you can store it in part of this. Apart from that, you can even store special characters and numerical values also in this, but they'll be considered to be a character value. Then you have the Boolean type. Again, Boolean is very straightforward. It can store either true or false value accordingly. So any questions with respect to the primitive data types present in Java? Okay, Prashant is asking me, can we convert a number stored inside character to an integer? Definitely. So you can convert accordingly, Prashant, but that's a process called typecasting. But for now, don't worry about it. You can convert it accordingly. Okay, so Henry is asking me, can I store a word inside a character? No, Henry, you cannot store a complete word inside a character. But for that, we have another type that is called strings, but we'll discuss that in the upcoming slide. So don't worry about it. All right. So moving forward, let's see a use case where you're going to be using the different data types. So now let's look at a use case. So John owns a department store. So he wants to create a bill which has to have the following fields, but John does not know Java. So he wants you to help him out and create the corresponding fields with the correct data types. So you're going to have an invoice ID. You're going to have a product ID. You're going to have a product cost, you're going to have a quantity, a discount, total price and whether the customer has provided feedback. So can you guys guess which data type is going to be associated to which field? All right, so most of you have made your guesses. Let's see how many of you are correct. Your invoice ID is going to be integer. Your product ID is going to be integer. After that, your product cost is going to be double. Now, some of you have guessed it to be float, but again, we prefer using double over float because it is more precise. After that, your quantity is going to be again integer, discount is going to be double, total price is going to be double and whether feedback has been provided or not is going to be boolean based on true or false value. Now, let me just show you how to declare these values as such in the Eclipse. So, the first thing that you need to do as part of your Eclipse is you need to create a new project. So, on the leftmost icon present here, you can select the Java project option. So, here you need to specify the name of the project. So, I'll call it Java. And then you can directly click on finish and automatically a new project is created. Now inside that project you can see you have source as well as the Java system library. This is basically all the libraries to which you can access to as part of your Java environment. So now I need to create a new class file. So right click and then go to the option and click class file. So I had mentioned to you earlier as well everything that you're going to be writing is going to be part of a class. So click on class and then you need to specify the name of the class. Now one thing to remember is that as part of the naming conventions for class, you cannot use white spaces as such. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make it as retail shop, retail underscore shop. So don't make any changes here as such, but one thing is make sure you have checked this option that is public static void main. This basically means that inside your class, your main function is going to be. So just click on finish and you have your class file created here. Okay, Bharat is asking me what does the main function do? Okay, Bharat, basically every time that you're going to be executing your code, your code starts executing from that main. So wherever you're going to be specifying your main, there your code starts executing. For now, don't worry about these concepts, public static void main. We'll be discussing more about that in our next session about classes and objects. For now, all you need to do is I'll show you how to declare these variables. So first what you're going to do is that you're going to specify integer type. Now for integer type all you need to do is specify int. So just type int and system will consider to be integer. So you can see it's been highlighted separately because these are reserved keywords. That is when you're using these keywords Java in turn understands that this refers to integer. Now in my integer I had my invoice number. So I'm going to say invoice underscore num. So this is a variable name. So wherever I'm going to use invoice number as part of my code, it basically means that this is a variable that is of integer type. So if you have multiple variables of the same type, rather than declaring them individually, all you can do is put a comma and then start specifying the next variable name. So after the invoice ID, we had the product ID. So that is product underscore ID. And then the third integer value that we had was quantity. So I'm going to call it quant and after every statement 
make sure you put a colon here. So this basically tells that this is an end of a statement. So in Java, it is very important that you make use of semicolon at end of every statement. So this is a challenge most programmers face initially where they forget to put semicolon at end of their statement and they end up having a lot of errors corresponding to that. So every statement has to end with a semicolon. After that, we had double values. So for double, what you're going to do is you're going to go next line and you're going to call it double. Now, I had my cost that was, so I'll just call it cost. Then I had discount and then I had my final price. So I'll just call it price. So these were doubles. Now to specify a Boolean type, you have to completely type Boolean B. That would be Boolean. And then you had feedback. So this is how you define different data types in Java. So by default, all the integers would be assigned zero. The doubles would be again 0, 0.0 and your feedback would be set as true. So are you clear on how to declare variables in Java? Okay, Divya is clear, so is Sandeep, Arun, Anna. That's great to see guys. So now that we've seen the various data types in Java, let's move forward and look at the various data operations that you can perform in Java. So you have mainly four different types of operators in Java. So you have your arithmetic operators, that is to perform arithmetic operation. You have addition, subtraction, division, and finally you have modulus. So this is something that you may not be familiar with if you're not from programming background. Basically what modulus does is that it performs division, but rather than giving you the quotient, what it gives you is the reminder of that division. So let's say you're going to perform five divided by three, rather than getting one, what you're going to be getting is that you're going to be getting two as the reminder value. And then you have the unary operator. Now the unary operators basically are increment and decrement value. So let's say there is a specific value that you have initialized. So let's say you have an A that is equal to 10. And somewhere in your program you want to increment it after a certain set of operations. So what you're going to do is that you're going to increment the value of A with the increment operation. Now, don't worry too much on this. We will be using the increment operator in the loop statements and I'll show you how it plays an essential role as part of control statements. Then you have the relational statements. Now, this is something that you may be familiar with. You have lesser than, you have greater than or equal to, you have lesser than equal to, you have greater than, you have not equal to. Again, not equal to is represented with an exclamation mark and equal to sign. So when you do that, it basically means it's a not equal to and for equal to, it is double equal to. Because if you put a single equal to, it will consider to be an assignment operation. So finally, we have the logical operators. Now in the logical operators, you have three main operators. You have and, or, and not. So basically the not condition is used to negate the corresponding value. So let's say there's a condition that is true, then if you want to negate it, you're going to be using a not value. Now, the two operators that you need to emphasize on is the AND and OR operators. So here you're going to be working with different conditions as such. That is, you're going to be using the AND and OR operator on different conditions. Now, let's say both my conditions are true. Okay, so in that case, both of these operators will give me the output to be true. But in case if one of your condition is true and the other is false. Now in that case, your OR operator will give you the output value to be true and your AND operator will give it to be false. So unless and until all your conditions are true, you will not get a true value to be output in case of an AND operator. But in case of an OR operator, as long as there's at least one true statement, then you can get the output to be true. Now these will be used in control statements again. Now don't worry, you'll be seeing that in the upcoming sessions, but I hope you've got a complete overview with respect to the different data operators. Okay, Divya is clear, so is Bharat now. Okay, so let me give you an example here. So basically what you're doing is that you're taking four different values and then you're correspondingly assigning them an operation. So I had told you earlier, equal to is used to assign a specific value to that variable. So this is an assignment operation. So this is also another operation that you're performing in Java. So what I'm doing is that I'm assigning num1 to be 10, num2 to be 15 and num3 to be 25. So here before you compute the value, what happens is that there is a board mass rule that you follow. Now this is something that you have again in maths that you may be familiar with. First the bracket value is computed, then you're going to be seeing the preference. So you have division first, multiplication, addition, then subtraction. So let's look at this operation present here. Now let me help you understand how it happens here. Now before any arithmetic expression is computed, you're going to be following the board mass rule. That is you're going to first consider the brackets, 
then you're going to be checking for if there's any divisions present then multiplications additions and finally subtractions so if you look at the operation present here inside the brackets you have an addition happening so you're going to add 10 plus 15 you're going to get 25 then you're going to come out before you subtract 25 from 25 you're going to perform the division operation that is 25 is going to be divided by 5 which will give you the output to be 5 so from 25 5 is going to be subtracted and you're going to get the output to be 20 now again when you see you're using an increment operator here now my original value of num1 was set to be 10 when i'm using the increment operator then it is going to be increased to 11 after that you're using a logical operator where you're comparing that is is num3 greater than equal to num1 plus num2 so 10 plus 15 is equal to 25 therefore it's going to give you an output to be true then you're checking is num2 equal to num1 this is why you're using a double equal to if you use a single equal to the value of num1 will be assigned to num2 so in case if you want to compare two values you're going to use a double equal to so num2 is not equal to num1 so it's going to give you an output of false and finally you're using a logical and operator here so is num2 lesser than num3 yes it is 15 is less than 25 and then you're going to check so one of my condition is true then when you come to the right hand side of the operator is num1 greater than num3 no that is false therefore i have true and i'm going to perform and operation with false value and this is going to give me a false output so we had discussed this earlier until and unless all my conditions are true I will not get an output to be true in case I'm using an AND operator. Finally, I had initialized num4 to be true and I'm negating that value, it is giving me an output of false. So I hope with this you're clear with respect to the data operations. Okay. So moving forward, let's look at use case where you'll be using these operators as such. So Matthew has come to John's retail store. Matthew wants to purchase a few products from John's store and he's given John the list of products that he wants. So John wants two quantity of item A, he wants a single quantity of item B and he wants three quantities of item C. So already the prices of these products have been displayed. Item A costs 200, item B costs 75 and item C costs 500. Now at the time Matthew visited John's shop. There was a 10% on all the products as such. Now from your total cost, you need to subtract 10%. Apart from that, there was also a 5% service tax applicable on this. So you need to add a 5% service tax as well. So let me show you how it is done. So now let's go ahead and write a code to compute this value. So I have three items which have a corresponding value. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to call them to be my variable. Since they don't have a decimal value, I'm going to make them integer. So int item a and then I'm going to initialize it with the corresponding value. So item a cost 200. So I have given the corresponding value. Then I had item b which is equal to 75 and then we had item C which was equal to 500. So again once you're done in declaring these variables put a colon and then we need another variable which will store the total price. So I'm going to call it double price. So you can see here we are not only declaring variables we are also initializing them with the corresponding values. In case if you want to set a corresponding value for a variable before you go ahead and use it, you can initialize it at the time of declaration itself. So that's exactly what we have done here. So now finally let's go ahead and compute our price. So price is equal to, now let's write the expression. So I'm going to use multiple parentheses here so that I can perform all the operations in one single code. Matthew wanted two quantities of item A. So item A into 2. Then he wanted a single quantity of item B. Finally, he wanted three quantities of item C. So item C into three. So with this, we've computed the total value of these products. But we've seen that there was a 10% discount associated with these products. So I need to compute that value. And then to that value, I need to add a 5% service tax. So again, price is equal to price minus 0.1 into price. So here what you're doing is that the existing value of price, you're going to subtract it with 10% of the price value. So this value once it's computed will be updated and stored inside price. So always you need to remember that the expression to the right hand side of assignment is computed first and then the corresponding value is stored inside the variable to the left.
And finally, we need to add a 5% tax to this. Now, to do that, just do 0 0.05 into price. So with this, we've also added the tax. So it's time we print out this value for it. Now, to print any command in Java, you're going to use the following syntax. That is system dot out dot print ln and then inside quotes you can specify what you want to print now there's another simple way of doing this all you need to do is just type sys out and then press control plus space so this will directly convert your sys out statement to system dot out dot print ln so this is basically a shortcut in eclipse so here I need to print my price value. So all you need to do is specify price. So with that, just save the code and then it's time we run it. Right click on the space and then you have an option here, run as. So select Java application and then you can see finally the output that is computed. So with this, I hope you're clear on how to use the various data operators and how you can print a corresponding value out to your screen. Okay, so I've got a confirmation from everyone. So let's move forward to the next topic that is the control statements. Now the control statements are basically the statements that will define how the flow of your program code is going to go ahead. Now there are mainly three types of control statements in Java. You have the selection statement, you have the iteration statement and then you have the jump statement. Now inside the select statement you have if and else then you also have switch case. Now these are two types of selection statements that you will be using based on your requirements. After that you have your iteration statements or as they are better known you have looping statements. So there are mainly three types of loops in Java. You have your while loop, you have your do while loop and you have your for loop. And finally we have jump statements that is break and continue which will be used to jump to a specific point in your program. Now don't worry we'll be discussing about each of them in detail. So now that you've got an overview of the various control statements let's move forward and look at each of them one by one. We'll start off with the if statement. Now the basic syntax for the if else control statement is that you have if followed by a condition then in case if the condition is true the statements which have to be executed. If the condition is to be false it will go to the else block and then it will execute the statements here. So it's not restricted that you can only check one condition with if else you can have a multiple if else statement. So you can check if condition one is true then you can execute statement one else if you can check condition 2 if condition 2 is true then you can go and execute statement 2 again else if condition 3 and so forth so you can have a laddered if else so I'll just give you an overview of how the if else works so you always start your program and then you check whether it is raining now if it is found to be true that is if it's raining then you need to take an umbrella but if it's not true then you are going to go play football so are you clear with respect to how an if else statement works? Okay, Prashant says yes, so does Bharat, Henry is clear, Divya, Arun, that's great to see you guys. Now moving on ahead, the next selection statement that you're going to be talking about is the switch case statement. Now when compared to the if else statement, the switch case is quite straightforward. So here what you're going to do is that you're just going to write switch and then the expression here. So you need to understand here in case of a switch putting in an condition would become problematic. Here you need to specify a direct expression as such. Now to give you a better idea let's say if you want to compare two numbers then you're going to use an if else statement. But let's say if there's a specific value that you want to check against then you're going to be using a switch case. So how switch case works is you specify switch followed by the expression then you come inside the loop and then you start writing the different cases. So your case 1 will check against the value that the expression will be taking and then if it is true it will execute statement 1 and then it will break from that switch case statement. But if it is found to be false then it will check the next case. Now if the next case is found to be true it will execute statement 2 and then it will break from that. So I hope with this you have got a general idea. So to give you a better understanding of how the switch case works let's look at an example here. So basically you are tossing a coin here. So if it's heads then Tom wins and then it's the end of the game. But if it is false and it's true then Adam wins and the game ends. But let's say you've taken a wrong input from the user. Then you're going to go to the default statement and then print invalid input and come. Now the default statement is the last case that is going to be executed if your expression does not meet any of the case values that you have specified. 
So are you clear with respect to how the if else statement works and how the switch case statement works? All right. Okay, now let me give you an example with respect to the if else and switch statement. Let's go back to our pricing system itself. So here, let's say you want to provide an additional discount to the customer if he's purchased over 1500 rupees. So what you want to do is that you want to write an if else statement here. So if my price is greater than 1500, then what you're going to do is that you're going to print congrats you have a 25% discount coupon. Now in case if it is not greater than 1500 then what I'll do is I'll change it else then here you're going to specify the else condition I'm just going to say thank you for shopping with us. So basically what we're trying to establish here is that if the customer has purchased products worth more than 1500 from John Shaw, then he's going to get an additional 25% discount coupon that he can use next time. So again, when the next time that he comes, instead of giving him a 10% discount, he can avail a 25% discount. But in case if he's not purchased more than 1500, then he does not, then the corresponding message does not get executed. So I'll just run this program again. So you can see he's purchased for 1,866. So therefore he's getting a discount of 25%. So here let's say I'm going to reduce the price that he's paid. Price is equal to price minus 500. This is just to show you how the else statement will get executed. If I rerun this code again, then you can see only thank you for shopping us is being printed. So Originally he had purchased for 1800 but when we are checking the condition we are subtracting for 500 therefore it is going to the else condition. So are you clear with respect to how the if else statement works? Alright that's great. Now moving on we are going to talk about the various loops in Java. Now the purpose of having loops in our program is to help us reduce the code redundancy. So what you want to do is let's say you want to perform a certain set of operations multiple number of times then you're going to put it inside a loop state. So therefore you don't have to write the code multiple number of times the loop will execute it for any number of times that you wish. Now when we talk about the various loops in Java there are mainly three types of loops. You have the do while you have while and you have for. Now in the do while loop what happens is you execute the set of statements inside the loop once then you check if the condition is true. If it is true then you're going to go back and execute the condition till it becomes false. So basically a do while loop executes at least once and then only checks the condition. So it is an exit control loop where you're controlling when the controller should move out from the loop state. Okay. Similarly, when you look at while loop, now while is quite similar to the do while itself, but the difference is in while the condition is first checked and then you enter loop statement directly. So you mainly use while loop when you are not sure of the number of iterations you have to perform. Now you use do while and while loop mainly when you are not familiar with the number of iterations that have to happen. So what happens is it runs for an uncertain number of times and once you've met your condition, then you come out from the loop statement. The only difference between do while and while is that do while executes at least once before the condition is checked whereas while checks the condition and only enters the statements. After that you have for loop. Now for loop is also an entry control loop but the difference being you're going to use the for loop when you know the number of times you're going to repeat something. So let's say you want to execute a certain set of statements 10 times then you can put it in a for loop and specify it has to run for 10 times. So I hope you're clear with respect to the three types of loops we have. Okay, Divya is clear, so is John, Ajay, Santosh, Prashant, Anand, that's great to see you guys. So please let me know at any point if you're not following me or if you do have any doubts, let me know, I'll be able to clarify it them and there itself. Now, moving forward, let's look at the do while loop. Now the syntax for the do while loop is quite straightforward. You're going to specify the keyword do first and then you're going to specify these corresponding statements that you need to execute multiple times. So once the statement gets executed only then do you come to the while part where you're going to check the condition. If the condition is true then you go back to the do statement inside the loop and then you execute that statement. Once you executed that statement again it comes out to the while you check the condition and then again if it's true it will keep going back and doing the same until the condition is false. So you need to understand how the cycle works so let me give you an example for that. 
So you always start to a point and then you execute the block of code that you want to execute. This runs at least once. Then what happens is you check if the condition is true or false. Now in case if it is false then you exit the loop. But if it's true you're going to go back to the point of do and then you're going to repeat the same execution of the statements. So are you clear with respect to how a do while statement works? Alright, so after that we're going to look at the while statement. Now if you remember with the do while condition you had a first do then you execute the statement and then you check the condition. But here what happens is first itself while checks if the condition is true. Only if it is true does it enter and then execute the following statements. So every time before you enter the loop you're going to check the condition is true or false. So you're going to start the probe and then you're going to check the condition straightforward. So if it is false you're going to exit from that loop. But if it is true, then you're going to go back and keep repeating till the condition turns false. I hope you have understood how the while loop works and the difference between do while and while loop. All right. Now, finally, we have the for statement. Now, the for statement, as I have mentioned, is used when you have to run it a limited number of times. So the syntax for for is slightly different. Here, you're going to have three major concepts. You're going to have an initialization. You're going to have a condition and then you're going to have an iteration. So basically what happens is you initialize a variable here to the value that you want. Then you're going to specify the condition based on which it is checking. And finally you're going to specify the iteration. So let's say you want to execute a statement five times. Then you can initialize the variable value to one. Then you can check if it is less than or equal to five. And then you can always iterate it using a incremental operator. So for five times the statement present inside will get executed. So again if you look at the flow of for loop you can start the code. You first begin by initialization, then you move forward and check the condition. Now if the condition is false, then you exit the loop. But if it is true, you will execute the corresponding statements. Once you've completed the execution of the statements, then you go ahead and iterate the value and go back to checking if the condition is true or false. So are you clear with respect to how the do while and for loop works? Now don't worry, I'll be giving you an example to understand each of these loops one after the other. Now finally you have the break statement. So let's say you're, you're going to run a loop for infinite number of times. But there should be a point when you need to leave out from that loop. And that is exactly why the break statement comes into picture. Now using the break statement you can leave the control of the loop when a specific condition is met. I will show you a flow of this that will give you a better understanding. Now you start execution of your code then you're going to check the loop condition. So basically you're going to write a break statement inside a loop or you've seen it earlier also in the switch case condition. Now in the switch case statement what happens is that if a case is executed then you break out from the control of the switch case and that's where you use break. So what happens if you do not use a break statement inside switch case is that every corresponding case after the case you want it will get executed. So I'll show you the example for that as well. But for now let's try to understand this. So once you've checked your loop condition, if it is false you'll exit from the loop. But if it is true, you'll come down and you'll check if the break condition is true. Let's say it's going to be true. Then you're going to execute from that loop. But if it turns out to be false, then you're going to execute the statements that are remaining in the loop and then go back to repeating that loop. So every time while the loop is getting executed, you're going to check if the break condition is met. If it is, you leave from the loop and if the break condition is never met, then you'll exit from that loop as well. Once you've completed the execution of that loop. But opposite to the break statement is the continue statement. Now with continue what happens is that every statement that is after the continue keyword does not get executed if the continue keyword is true. So let's say you're going to start execution of a program. Then you're going to enter the loop condition. If it is false you're going to exit from that loop and if it is true you're going to execute a certain set of codes. Now in between these codes you have your continue keyword. So if the continue condition is considered to be false then every statement after that will get executed and you will go back to execution of that loop. But let's say it is true then what happens is that every statement that is after the continue keyword does not get executed in that iteration of that loop. So every time a continue keyword is found to be true, the execution of block 2 does not happen. So I hope you're clear with respect to how the break and continue statement works. Now to give you a better understanding of how the loops works, let's look at a use case here. Mary is a school teacher. She's conducted final year exams for her students for five different subjects. 
Now, as there are multiple students, she wants to create an automated system that will take the marks of each of the students, calculate the final score, and then give a distribu grade distribution for these students. So she's also given us a grade distribution chart here. So if the student has scored below 40%, then he's going to get a poor grade. But if he scored 40 to 59, he gets an average. Similarly, 60 to 79 gets him good. 80 to 89 gives it, gets him very good. And 90 plus gets them excellent. So we're going to write a Java code that makes use of loops as well as control statements to achieve this. So let's see how it's done. For this, I'm going to create a new file. So to do that, you can either go back to your project, right click and select new option from there. Or you can directly click on the new class option here. Once you've set the name, click on finished and you have your new class created. So I basically have five different subjects for which I'm going to take the marks. So I'm going to assume the marks are going to be in whole. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to consider the marks to be integers. So int, we had maths, physics, then you had chemistry, English, and finally you had computer science. Now I need to store the total marks somewhere. So I'm going to declare a double variable that is final score. So now it's time we begin with our looping statement. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start off with a do while statement. I'll say do, then open the parenthesis and then enter into it. So always make sure when you're writing a code in Java or any programming language for that instance, you follow the indentation because this will also help you identify where you've gone wrong and whether if you've missed any parentheses or such. So always follow the indentation rule. So the first thing what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take the subject wise marks for each student. I need to take the match marks first. So this statement will request for the marks for maths. It will print out a statement that says enter marks for maths. Now it's time we go ahead and take the input from the user. Now before you go ahead and take the input from the user, there's one thing that you need to do is that you need to create an input objects. So I have already discussed this with you. Everything that we do in Java is through objects as such. Now to create an object for taking input, I'll show you the syntax. It's going to be scanner followed by the variable name through which you're going to take the input. So in our case, I'm going to call it marks equal to new. Now new is a keyword through which you're going to create a new object. So new and then you have to specify the original class to which it belongs. So that's again scanner here. And then you need to specify system in. Now this is one of the statements through which you're going to create the object. But before that you need to import a certain package from the Java library. So to do that just type import java dot util dot star. Now this basically imports everything from Java's util package. Now once you've done that, you can use the scanner function. So to take an input from the user, what you need to do is specify the variable in which you're going to take the input. So in our case, I'm going to start off with maths is equal to the object that is used for input. So in our case, it's marks dot next int. So what this basically means is that the next integer value that is being given by the user should be taken and stored inside maths. So are you clear on how to take input from the user in Java? Okay, Prashant is clear, so is Bharat, Henry, Dave, that's great to see. Now I need to take marks for the next five subjects, so rather than typing it out, I'm going to just copy paste this. So maths, after that you have chemistry, you have physics, you have English, and finally you have computer science. Change the corresponding variables as well. Now this is for chemistry, so let's rename it to chemistry. The next one was for physics. Then we had English, and finally computer science. So with this, I have taken the marks from all the students. So now it's time I go ahead and compute his final score. Now to do that, what you're going to do is that you're going to write final score is equal to. Then you have to add all the marks and then divide it by five since we have five subjects. So let's add each of these marks. That's maths plus English 
plus chemistry plus physics and finally computer science all this divided by 5 and has to be stored inside final score so any questions still here are you clear with respect to how we've used the input output statements and how we've taken the input from the user all right now the next part is to assign the grade now the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create an if else ladder for this so if my final score is greater than 90 then he's going to get excellent i'm going to say else if that is if the first statement is not true then check final score greater than 80 so if you remember the second statement was between 80 to 89 now if it is not greater than 90 only then will it come to else if part so here I'm gonna say very good Again, I have another else if, else if final score is greater than 60, he gets just good. Then you have another else if, where if my final score is greater than 40, then I'm just going to print average. Now after this, I'm not going to write an else if ladder, I'm just going to write else. The final result that is if he's got below 40% that is poor. Now here what we've done is that we've used the if else ladder and specified which grade to get in case of a specific range. So now what you need to do is you need to still specify the while condition here. But before that, you need to understand when to exit from that loop. Now for that, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to write an output statement. Any more students? To know if there are any more students present, I want my user to tell me if it is true or not. So they're going to specify true or false. Now to store the true or false value, I need a Boolean variable. So let's go back and declare a new Boolean variable. So here let's say result is equal to again use our input variable that's marks dot next boolean that is the next in boolean value that is inputted should be stored inside result that is while my result statement is always true keep executing this statements so when you say while result it basically means till the time my result value is false keep executing these set of statements so any questions still here on how we've used the if else ladder or how to use this do while loop? All right, repeat. So let's go ahead and execute this program. So it's asking me to enter the marks for max. Let's say 85, then chemistry is 47, 56, 75, 92, and then you get a grade that is true. So in case if I say true, it's gonna again ask me the marks for max. So again, let's go with 75, 84, 92, 48, 56, and then you can see the corresponding result. So finally, let's say if I'm gonna say false, it exits from that program. So are you clear with respect to how the do while loop is executing? All right, now, same thing can be also changed to a while loop. Now, all you need to do is that you need to remove the while from here, go back to where you've written your do, go there, and then, mention the while here so here what is happening is that first you're checking the result and then you're going to enter this loop now before you go ahead and enter this loop this value has to be assigned to be true because until and unless the statement is true it will not enter this condition so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to initialize it to be true and then I'm going to begin the execution of the statement so are you clear with respect of how do while and while differs between both so here basically it will run infinite number of times till you're going to enter a false value but in the previous case it's going to execute at least once and then it will ask if you have any specific values and keep running till you enter a false value. 
Now in the do while loop it executes at least once but the while loop will execute only if the condition is to be found true. Now in the same case let's say you know the total number of students beforehand itself. Then what you can do is that you can use a for loop here. So what I'm going to do is that I know the number of students. So I'm going to remove this last statement from here. And before I enter my loop, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask the number of students. Once you have that, you're going to assign it to a corresponding value. Since I don't need this, I'm going to remove it. Let's say here I have another integer value that is student number. So again, let's say student number is equal to my marks dot next int. That is the next integer value entered should be my number of students. So with this, you already established the total number of students for whom you want to enter the results. Then you're going to go ahead and execute the for loop. Now, if you remember the command for for, it is for, and then you begin with your operation. So here you need to start with initialization. So I'm going to use a variable known as i, which will increment its value and always keep comparing with the number of students. So let's say int i equal to zero, because always the numbering in Java programming, be it the numbering of array, be it the number of looping, everything is suggested to start from zero. The counting system in Java or most programming languages starts from zero instead of one. So it's always recommended that you start from zero. Now for i is equal to zero, i less than student number. And after the execution of each statement, I want to increment the value of i by one, so i plus plus. So any doubts with respect to the syntax of the for loop? Okay, Prashant is clear, so is Bharat, Sandeep, Santosh, that's great to see guys. So now let's save this and re-execute this code once again. So run as Java application, you're going to ask the number of students, let's say two, enter marks for maths. So you've got your result for first student, let's try it again. It's got good and then you can see it has exited from that loop. So our loop has run twice. So any questions with respect to how the for loop works or the while or do while? Okay, so now that everyone is clear with respect to how the for and do while loop works. So now let me show you another program where you're going to be using both break and continue. Let me create a new class. Let's me call it number sequence. So here what I'm going to do is that I'm going to run my for loop 50 times. But inside my for loop, I'm not going to print even numbers. And in case if my number crosses 20, I'm going to break out from that loop. Let me show you how it's done. So let's say for i equal to 1. Now in this case, my counting has to start from 1 because I'm going to check from 1 to 50 i less than equal to 50 and i plus plus. Now inside this you need to specify both your break and continue statement. So first thing let me check if the number is odd or even. So to do that all you have to do is say if i modulo 2. So if my number divided by 2 is going to be equal to 0. then that means that the number is an even number because all even numbers when divided by 2 gives me a reminder 0. So in that case, I'm going to write a continue statement. That means don't bother with the statements after this. Go ahead to the next iteration. If not, then else I'm going to print that number. So I. So what happens here is that it's going to run and print all the odd numbers till 50. Save it and let's execute this. So you can see all the odd numbers are printed. But let's say I don't want to print the numbers that are more than 20, then I'm going to write another statement if i greater than 20. In that case, break. So you need to change it to else if, and then let's run this again. So you can see here, initially when it was printing till 50, but at this point when it is greater than 20, it's breaking out from that loop. 
So I hope you're clear with respect to how the for loop works, how the while loop works, how the do while loop works, and how the break and continue statement are part of this programming style. So I've got a confirmation from Divya, Prashant, Bharat. So that's great to see you guys. Now, I hope you guys are trying out these codes simultaneously but so that in case if you're facing any challenges, you can let me know and I'll be able to assist you as well. So moving forward, we're going to talk about the next concept that is arrays in Java. So remember our good old friend John? John is facing a new problem now. Now John has 15 invoices that he wants to store with the corresponding amount but he doesn't want to store them as different numbers. Now to solve John's problem we have a data structure that is array. Now an array is used to store elements of the same type in a sequential order. Now an array can also be single dimensional or multi-dimensional and each array has mainly two components. Now the first is its corresponding index and the second is the corresponding values. So when you have a sequence of values to be stored, they'll be stored in the value segment and the index is something that gets automatically incremented based on the number of values you want to store. So the indexing starts from 0 and goes on till n minus 1 of the size of the array. So let's say if you want to store 15 numbers, then it starts from 0 and goes all the way till 14. But let's say if you want to extract a specific value from an array index, that is let's say you want the fourth value present there, then you need to only specify the corresponding index and the value can be extracted from this. Now I have already told you there are two types of array. You have the single dimensional array and you have the multi-dimensional array. Now for initializing the single dimensional array, you have this following syntax where you specify the data type of the array, then the name and then you use square parentheses. This is to help Java understand that it is going to be an array. Then you need to specify the keyword new. I had mentioned to you earlier as well. You're going to use new to create new objects as such. So here array is also an object and then again the data type as well as the size of the array. So below you can see we've created an array with the name A of the size 12. The indexing starts from 0 and goes on all the way to 11 and corresponding values are being stored here. So let's say if you want the value of 7 then all you need to do is take A of 6. Now when we talk about a multi-dimensional array, your data is going to be stored in a matrix format. So you can see the initialization is also slightly different. You again specify the data type, the name of the table, then you're going to use two sets of square brackets. Now this is to help Java understand that this is not a single dimensional array but a multi-dimensional array. Then again the new keyword comes followed by the size of the multi-dimensional array. So here you can see we specified the number 4 and 5. This is to help Java understand that I need 4 rows and 5 columns in my table. So you can see here the array indexing starts from 0 to 3 for the rows and 0 to 4 for the columns. So this is how your multidimensional array looks like. It's similar to a matrix that you use in mathematics. So I hope you're clear with respect to how an array looks like and how to initialize one because we're going to go ahead and help John out with his invoice problem. Alright, so Divya has given me a confirmation. So is Bharat. Adam, Henry, Prashant. Let's go back to our Eclipse. So here let me create a new class. I'm going to call it Array Help. So we need a two-dimensional array. So again, this is going to have amount. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make it a multi-dimensional array of double format. So double, I'm going to say invoice. And then you need to specify that it's a multi-dimensional array. So two square brackets and then equal to new double. So here you need to specify the size of the array. Now John had told us he had 15 invoices and he also said that he wants to store the invoice number with the corresponding amount. So basically I am going to create a new two-dimensional table which is going to have 15 rows and two columns. Now to do that you need to first say 15 and in the second case it's going to be 2. So any doubts on how to create a multi-dimensional array? Alright, so to access a multi-dimensional array what you're going to need is that you're going to need multiple nested for loops. So let me just show you how it's done. So let's say for int i equal to 0. My i should be less than 15 that is the row number and i++. Plus plus. Now for j 
equal to again 0, j less than 2, j plus plus. So here first I'm going to ask him to enter the value. And then I'm going to take the input. Now again, if you remember how to take input, you need to first import dot util java dot util dot star. So this command completely loads the util and you can go ahead and then create a scanner object. You CA scanner and this is a system input so system dot input. So now it's time I take the input from the user and then store it into my invoice tip. So invoice of I that is my row and my column is equal to input dot next double. So are you clear on how to take an input for the array? Now for printing out the output what you're going to do is that you're going to use a system output in which you can directly print the value. Which so if i comma j and then a colon. So let's just run this program. It's going to ask me set of values. So I'm going to give random set of values here. So let's say 157 point zero so you have your complete set of values that is being displayed here so are you clear with respect to how arrays work and how we've stored it separately? Now this is just a sample value so don't go by that. But again I hope you've got the idea of how to use arrays. So coming back to our presentation we've helped John solve with it. And finally we come to our final topic that is the object oriented programming. Now every one of you already heard about object oriented programming style. I've also discussed about how everything is considered to be an object in Java. But let's just give have a brief overview of what a class is and what an object is here. After that we'll move forward to discuss the four main concepts of object oriented programming. Now Java is object oriented and a class based programming language. So we've seen how Java is a class based programming style and I already told you everything here is considered to be an object. But then you may have been wondering what is an object in itself. So basically when you talk about an object anything that exists can be considered to be an object. So let's say you and I are actually objects from the human class or let's say your dog or your cat is an object from the animal class as such. So I hope you get the idea. So in a class you're going to define what are the basic functionalities each of the objects should have but each object is unique when compared to each other. Like how you and I are not the same but even though we are objects from the human class. Now to give you a better understanding here you can see how a blueprint of a house is depicted. Now this basically is your class. This tells you how the house should look like. But your individual house in itself is an object. It may have the same features as the class but there would be certain changes with respect to this. And you cannot expect all the houses designed with the same blueprint to be the same because there may be slight variations as such. So are you clear with respect to what is a class and what is an object? Now to call any programming language as an object oriented programming language there are mainly four concepts that it needs to cover. Now the first concept that we will be discussing is inheritance. Now basically inheritance is a mechanism through which one object acquires all the properties from its parent object. So we've already seen this concept actually. We, I just gave you an example as well. Now if you see in the image here it's referring to the same example where your super class or your parent class is animals but when you look at the child class it can be amphibians, it can be reptiles, it can be mammals or it could be birds. But when you look at their parents it's considered to be animals as a super class. Now through inheritance you can achieve code redundancy and you can highly make use of code reusability. 
So let's say there's some common function or some common variable that you want to be present across multiple classes, then all you need to do is specify that into the base class or the parent class. Then all the child that will be inheriting from this class will have these same set of variables or functions. Now, talking about functions, functions basically are a set of codes. So these codes would perform a specific operation and give you the desired result. Again, functions are quite handy when you have to perform specific set of operations with different sets of values. Now, don't worry, we'll be talking extensively about functions as well as these concepts in our upcoming session, but let's just have an overview of these concepts as well. After that, we have the encapsulation concept. Again, encapsulation is a highly useful concept in object-oriented programming. Now through encapsulation what you're going to ensure is that now the variables that are present in a class can only be modified or changed by a method present in the same class. So let's say you have multiple classes that are linked to each other and one class is trying to change the value of a variable present in the other class. Now this is not directly possible. To do that you need to have an object from the class in which you want to change the variable name. So basically what you're doing here is that you're binding the code and the data manipulation together. That is if an object belongs to a class, then only a method from that class can change the value of that object. So are you clear with respect to encapsulation and inheritance? Okay, Prashant is clear, Bharat, Henry, Divya, that's great to see. Now moving on, the next concept that we're going to be discussing about that is polymorphism. Now, a polymorphism basically is ability of a variable or a function or even an object to take multiple forms. So here we are not going to go in much in detail with respect to how a polymorphism is applicable here because one of the key achievements that you are going to get through polymorphism is obtained through function overloading. And I will just give you an introduction of function overloading here. So let's say you are writing multiple lines of codes. And again, let's go into the example itself. Let's say you want to draw a specific diagram. Now, you're going to have multiple functions present already as part of your program. So, the functions that deal with drawing, I'm just going to call them draw. But based on the values that I pass to these functions, it is going to draw different shapes. So, let's say in case of a rectangle, I'm going to need two values, that is length and breadth. Let's say in case of a circle, I'm going to need at least the radius of it. I hope you get the general idea. Based on the values that you pass, different functions will be called that serves different purposes. So this is achieved using function overloading. Now don't worry if you're not clear with this, I'll be talking about this extensively in our next session. Now final concept that we are talking about is data abstraction. Now basically when we talk about data abstraction, it means that you're hiding the details and only showing the essential details. Now if you look at the image here, basically whenever we get a call, we just see an option to either pick it up or cancel it. But in truth, there are a lot of codes that run for every action that you do. But we do not need to worry about that. All we need to do if you need to pick up a call is either swipe right or if you want to cut the call, you're going to swipe left. And in Java, you're going to again obtain abstraction through abstract classes and interfaces. This is something that we'll be covering as part of our upcoming sessions as well. So I hope with this you've got a complete overview of the various object oriented concepts of Java and moving forward let's look at summary of today's session. We started with an introduction of Java then I helped you understand why learn Java. We saw the key features of Java or the buzzwords as they are called these days. Then I help you understand how Java works and we discussed the various data types and the data operators in Java. Finally moving forward we saw the various control statements and the arrays present in Java. Now with that, thank you and have a great day.